Bulletin so important. Inside of that bulletin, there is a form to be able to pick seven men and just seven men alone to be able to serve our church for the next three years as a deacon. They will begin their duties on September the 1st. That's right. So also tomorrow, uh, the 18th, the Stella Patton group will meet in the fellowship hall at six o'clock in the evening. Bring your favorite snack, come fellowship and uh, learn a little bit more about the, mi the mission field. Uh, now, July 24th, which is next Sunday morning, bring your coats, get the scarves, it's Christmas in Dixie in July. We're going to have Christmas at Broadway, July 24th. We're going to come in. We're going to learn about Operation Christmas Child, backpacks for blessings, the angel tree. We're going to hear from Walk Through Bethlehem, and we're going to sing some of your favorite Christmas songs. We're going to come in and worship. We're going to worship the Lord and learn about what our December ministry is going to look like. Now, what's following the service? Absolutely. Extremely busy day. We have our church picnic also on the 24th. That's from 2 to 5. Now, at that church picnic. Now, we've said a bunch of things over the last couple of weeks on that, and we're extremely sorry. The reason that we're having to change all this is because we're, we're planning it. So be patient with us. Uh, we need you, church, to bring your favorite treat, your favorite snack, um, to be able to share with everybody that comes. Right, right. We're, we're going to have a Everybody's going to eat your food. Yeah. Everybody, right? So also in that, we're having a cornhole tournament and a ladder ball tournament. This will be the last week that you can sign up. So if you haven't signed up yet, make sure you do so on the back table. A trophy will be presented to the winners of those two things. And we're also going to have bingo downstairs for those who might not want to. With door prizes. With a ton of door prizes that Taylor's personally picked out. And for the kiddos, we're going to have some bounce houses in the sanctuary for that as well. And this is all inside, church. Well, this is not outside. We don't want you to burn up in the heat. We want you to have a great time with us right here in our beautiful sanctuary. So also, yeah, August the 6th, another incredible opportunity for our ladies to gather in worship. It is our women's conference that's coming up, right? Our Ladies, ladies of Grace, Grace Women's Conference. Um, Carmen Smith is going to be our speaker. It's from 10 to 1230 that day. There will be um, a speaker, like I said, Carmen Smith, and also... Our own ladies of Broadway are leading worship That's that right. day. So it's going to be an incredible day. If you haven't signed up, please do so on that back table on the yellow sheet, right? And other than that, we got some more announcements. Yeah, it sounds like a good time. Yeah. Now, speaking of a good time, the Merry Makers. It's in the name. Merry. They make merry times. That's right. Now, they're going to be meeting on July 21st at Joanne Legrand's house. So if you have any questions about that gathering, contact her. They're going to provide the meat. It'll be a wonderful time of fellowship. Last time they met, I was the speaker. I'm sorry you missed out on that if you didn't get to come, but I'm sure there'll be a, a great time nonetheless. Absolutely. And church, one last thing before we go. Today is the day that our students leave for student, for student camp. So here's the thing, parents, if your student is going on that camp and you haven't taken your student's luggage outside to the trailer, please do so before you leave today. Or if you said, hey, I have no clue because my kids don't tell me anything, go home, tell your student to pack and bring it back up to the church before seven o'clock tonight because we need to be able to take that and load that in our trailer yeah. tonight so we can have it up there ready for our students. And also, if you haven't received a list of all the students that's going to camp this year, all of our incredible volunteers that's going, on that back table again, there is a list of students names and volunteers names that's going we want you to grab one of those on your way out today because we want you to pray specifically that our students would encounter a real god that's right. in jesus christ this week at camp and you need to pray for me and taylor too because we're going so here's the thing not only do you need to pray for us but you need to pray for these kids because we're going that's right now if you are a first-time visitor or if you have been here a few times and you just uh you got questions or we we haven't had a chance to meet you yet this is an important step. We have a connect card in the bulletin. It tears out. It is perforated for your convenience. If Logan can do it, so can you. And so we need you to fill that out and we need you to put that in the box that is placed around the sanctuary. We have your information and we'd love to know a little bit more about you, hear from you and get to know you. So uh, thank you for joining us here at Broadway. We hope you are ready for worship and uh, we love y'all. Thank you for joining us for week three of the Broadway, the Broadway Broadcast. Broadcast. Told the first service it's hard to take me serious after watching that. <laughs> Welcome to Broadway this morning. So this morning we learn a new song, and we all join in a moan of just uh, disgruntledness. We don't want to learn new stuff. No, this morning I'm going to ask you to recite something for me. It's not on the screen because we should know it. Everyone join in re reciting back to me. What does John 3.16 say? For God so... That whosoever. 
That's it. Great job. I'd give you 50 Awana bucks if I could. This song is exactly those words. I said at the beginning of me coming here, told the committee, told many people, we are going to sing things and songs that point back to Scripture. We are going to sing songs that are backed and soundly proved by Scripture. And what better way to do that than singing Scripture itself? And so this song is a new one. It opens up, we will sing the chorus twice like we did the last new song, His Mercy is More. And it is just those words of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. And in the middle of this song, it goes into my favorite song, In This World, the doxology. It combines tradition, it combines contemporary modernism, and we don't lose either. Yet we join in unified worship singing God's word. It can't get any better than this. Let's stand. Join us. Listen to the first time through the chorus. Try to sing with us the second time through the chorus, and we'll go into the song.
failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there. God so loved the world. Let's go. 
What? 
church, would you pray with me? Father, we love you. We're so thankful for your presence. We're so thankful that we serve a God who, who comes to us and who chases us down, Father, and who chooses us and saves us. Father, I pray that we would take these next few minutes we just sit in your presence. We'd be able to, to worship you in spirit and in truth, and God, that we ultimately would become better disciples of who you are. God, that we would seek your face. We'd seek your presence, not just today, but all the days of our lives. And Father, that we would be people who are committed to you. We are people who are going out and telling others about this man named Jesus who has so radically changed our lives and saved our souls. And hopes that maybe, maybe just maybe, that you'll reveal yourself to them and they'll place their faith in you. So Father, this morning I pray that if somebody here hasn't, that Father, that you would show them that grace is freely given from you to them. And Father, this morning as Pastor Kevin comes to preach, I pray that you would give him words to say to encourage us and inspire us and give us passion to share your gospel with those who may have never heard it before. And Jesus will give you glory and honor and praise this morning and all the days of our lives. Thank you for the cross and thank you for the empty tomb. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Children's Church is dismissed. <clears throat> well, good morning. Good to see each and every one of you with us this morning. If you're a visitor with us today, we welcome you and are so grateful that you have come to be with us. Uh, as you heard in the opening video, today is Deacon Election Day, and so uh, hopefully you have a ballot in your hand. Does anybody not have a ballot? We have just a few left. Anybody? If you'll lift your hand. If you need a pen, we have some pens. We'll ask you to mark those ballots, and uh, hopefully you have given some time to think about it, and you see the ones there in front of you. We do ask that only members of our church uh, be voting in this time, so uh, we are glad that you guests are here today, but this is something we would really would ask that our members be a part of. While, <coughs> while you're marking your ballot, let me tell you that uh, this week in our business meeting, uh, we at uh, the church voted to license uh, Logan McKenzie to the gospel ministry. And so thank you for that. If you affirm that, would you say amen? amen. We are grateful for all that uh, you do and uh, helping Logan as he continues to grow and uh, continue to follow God's call upon his life. Uh, the next step for Logan is that we will begin a process of ordination uh, about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it got to where it was just extremely difficult on a Sunday afternoon to gather an ordination council together. Pastors are extremely busy in the day in which we live. So I have been wrestling over the last couple of months of how to go about involving more ministers in the ordination process. And I've talked to the ministers at the mission center. They meet every Monday and they have agreed to uh, allow Logan to come to a Monday morning minister's meeting, and they will go through a time of examination with him there. And then we will have an ordination council that will gather on some Sunday out in the future, and uh, we will have an ordination council meet and then an ordination service for some Sunday evening. But thank you so much for all that you do as a church, and thank you for all that you're going to do as we continue to help Logan, follow God's call upon his life. Well, does anybody need more time? Anybody need a ballot or a pen or anything? Well, it's kind of like uh, giving directions to cats, but uh, this section and that section, if y'all will point them to the center aisles in between the two, uh, where you see Monk and uh, Scott McFall, if you'll pass your ballots to the end of the row there, uh, they will make sure that your votes are counted, and uh, we appreciate so much what you do in the work of our de deacon ministry. This year, we had more men nominated than any year that I ever remember at Broadway, and I think this year, on your ballot that you have there in your hand, we have more men that agreed to serve, and uh, thank you for your willingness to help us to select men uh, that will serve our church for a period of three years. And thanks to all the men that have agreed to serve. Well, 
My time is getting away. Anybody else need uh, to hand in a ballot? Anybody? Anywhere? Got one over here. Okay, very good. Anyone else? Well, last Sunday morning, I talked to you about how you are made for more. And this morning, I want to continue along those very same lines. God made you more than just to sit in church to enjoy a good worship experience. God made you more. And he has made you for opportunities that are around you each and every day of your life. It is amazing at the opportunities that God gives us if we will just uh, sort of walk with God through the day you'll find opportunities all around you to encourage someone uh, to be used by God, possibly even as a witness to someone who is experiencing some kind of difficulty, and they themselves have come to a point where they know they need someone beyond themselves. It is amazing how God can bring us to those points and how God wants to use you uh, in uh, the reaction to those times. This past Wednesday night, in our Wednesday night Bible study, we were looking at the uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. God told Philip to just go stand beside the chariot. And when he got there, uh, he had never met this man from Ethiopia, but when he stood beside the chariot, the Ethiopian was reading a passage from the Old Testament that really just sort of talks about Jesus. It's very obvious that God was working in that moment. And Philip shared with him how he personally could know that man, and he was saved and was baptized. And God has the same kind of opportunities out there for you. They may not be as simple as what uh, Philip went through, but God wants to use you in ways way beyond anything that you can understand. You were made for more. I want us to look this morning at a passage from the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, verse number 4, the Bible says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Then, when they met together, they asked him the question, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, that's a loaded question. It really takes some time to unpack everything that the disciples were asking but many scholars believe that they were asking, is this the time you're going to bring an end to all oppression? Is this the time you're going to bring an end to all suffering? Is this going to be the time that you'll end all the struggles and all the difficulties of life? Now, I don't know how much time you have spent in church, but most Christians look at that question and ask, are they asking about the end of times? And a lot of people think that they really are. And so Jesus is going to give them a rather abrupt answer. Notice in verse number 7, he said to them, It's not for you to know the times of the date the Father has set by his own authority. But what you need to know is this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, the disciples are asking, really, about the end of time. Is this when you're going to put everything in order? Is this when you'll restore the kingdom? Is this when the end will come? And Jesus is saying, don't get distracted by that. Rather, push away all those distractions. And what I need you to focus on is not the end of time, but what I need you to focus on is the here and the now. And what I need you to do right here, right now, is just be aware of opportunities that you have to be my witnesses everywhere you go. Whether you're in Jerusalem, Judea, you may go as far as Samaria, or you may extend yourself way out beyond the limits that you can imagine 
all the way to the ends of the earth. It's real easy in the day in which we live to get distracted by this thing called the end of times. There are still people in our world today that that really is all they focus on. I want to ask you, have you ever heard this name? You ever heard the name William Miller? Anybody? Anybody ever heard the name William Miller? William Miller was a preacher who lived from 1782 to 1884. Now, believe it or not, William Miller started out as a Baptist minister. If you look his name up, do a Google search, you'll find all sorts of denominations that now claim some kind of tie to William Miller. However, <laughs> Baptists are not on that list. He started out as Baptist. The Baptists really don't claim him anymore. William Miller actually studied the Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9, and he studied them and studied them and studied them, and finally, he made a prediction that Jesus would return in 1844. There was a man in that, he was aware, that, know, that knew him very well, and he asked him if he could uh, study his notes and just study some of the things that he had been studying. He wanted to see if, if William was actually right. And this man, by the name of Samuel S. Snow, after studying William Miller's notes thoroughly, he came to a conclusion that not only would Jesus return in 1844, but he predicted that Jesus would return on October the 4th, 1884. Now, here is something that I really do encourage you, if you have any computer ability at all, do a Google search on what is now known as the Great Disappointment because people were greatly disappointed that Jesus did not come in 1844. Do a Google search and you'll see. There was a tremendous fallout. Jesus said, don't get distracted with all this end time stuff. That stuff is the dates, the times that only God himself knows. He has the authority to know those things, and he knows them very well. Well, William Miller had a great following. Matter of fact, followers of William Miller were known as the Millerites. And through the years, there have been all kinds of variations of what William Miller was trying to do. One of the names that comes out of recent history is a name, Vernon Howell. Any of you ever heard the name Vernon Howell? Well, it wasn't a very popular name, so he changed it. He changed his name to David Koresh. Anybody ever heard the name David Koresh? He is a name that stands out in history. He too was one who believed that he knew roughly about the time and the way that Jesus would return to this earth. He changed his name to David because he was convinced that he was very much like King David. He would lead the people of God into a new kingdom. And he chose the name Koresh, and I don't understand all that was involved in this, but the, the word Koresh actually comes out of or comes from the name Cyrus. If you remember your Old Testament history, it was Cyrus uh, of Syria who, I mean, uh, well, Cyrus led uh, the people of God out of Babylonian captivity, and David Koresh really felt like he would be the Cyrus of the new day. Now, this is a very sad story. And it's a day that a lot of people look with great regret at what happened on this particular day. In February 1993, David Koresh had been gathering all kinds of weaponry because he felt like if the kingdom of God was going to come, he needed to be ready to fight on the, on the part of Jesus and the kingdom of God. He gathered all kinds of armament and weapons of every description. And the FBI had gotten word that many of these weapons were held illegally. And so they sent some officers in February to check the situation out. 
and it wound up in a shootout, which uh, brought about the death, I think, about six or seven FBI agents and four or five of the Branch Davidians, as they were called. But on April the 19th, the uh, Janet Reno finally gave the word after a standoff of 50 something days, it's time that we take this compound. And so they entered the compound with tanks and tear gas and all sorts of things. And when the tear gas went off, it actually somehow set off a tremendous explosion, a horrible fire, and there were just under 90 people lost their lives that day. Many of them were innocent women and small children who had no idea of what was taking place. Janet Reno still says that this is a day that she regrets giving that order. She wonders if there couldn't have been a better way. But this is what happens when people just fixate on when will the end time come. And that's all they think about. They don't hear anything about loving other people. They don't hear anything about being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, but rather they focus simply on that second coming. When will the end times be? In a more modern name that we're very familiar with, or I'm at least familiar with, was the name Edgar C. Wisenant. Anybody ever hear the name Edgar C. Wisenant? I was a student at Beeson Divinity School when I first heard this name. Interestingly enough, I did not hear it in a classroom. One day as I got home from school, I went to the mailbox and there was a little booklet that had been mailed to me. And the name of the booklet was 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. Now there was one major flaw with this book, and that is that there was a next book. The next book was entitled, The Final Shout, which is the Rapture Report of 1989. Well, not only was there a volume two, but there was a volume three as well. 23 reasons why a pre-tribulation rapture looks like it will recur on Rosh Hashanah of 1993. And if you're going to write three volumes, you just as well write four. He published another little booklet on 1994, and it was entitled, And Now the Earth's Destruction by Fire, Nuclear Bomb Fire, which was his prediction for 1994. Now, folks, these are a little bit humorous, but we don't make fun of these people because it is amazing how many people really do get distracted looking at all the evidence and all the things that we can dig around in and uncover and find and put our focus simply on the end of time when Jesus said, don't focus on those things, but rather I want you to focus on being my witness. Everywhere you go, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the world. Now, Jesus was not just trying to keep secrets. The Bible tells us that Jesus himself didn't know when that day was. Matthew 24, verse 36, the Bible says, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angel in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father in heaven. Now, what he does want us to know is he wants us to know that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth. Now, God wants you to be a witness. And a witness is not responsible for convincing people or anyone about anything. That's up to lawyers and all their arguments and the way that they look and analyze the facts of the case. But God simply wants you to be a witness 
of what you have experienced in your life as you have walked with God. A matter of fact, 1 John chapter 5 tells us anyone who believes in the Son has this testimony in his heart. So I ask you this morning, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Have you put your faith in him? Well, then you have a testimony in your heart. Now, as you think about being a witness, there are four things that I want you to think about this morning. And by the way, you need to write down your testimony. You need to just simply handwrite something that reminds you about the time, the place, what the experience was like. But you really need to focus on about four different things as you write your testimony. And by the way, you need to give yourself lots of room when you start writing because you will add to the story the longer that you live. You will have more experiences with God, and as you experience more of him, your testimony will grow richer and richer. Doesn't necessarily have to get longer and longer. You don't want to tell everybody about every day that you have lived, but as you experience other people, God will give you an opportunity to share with others what he has been doing in your life. I want you to think with me about four different things about your testimony. First of all, I want you to think about the testimony itself. That is the story of how you began your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, think about life lessons. These are some of the most important lessons that God has taught you along the way. Thirdly, think about godly passions, issues that God has shaped, used to shape you into being the person that you are. Now, every single one of us will experience the things of God differently. We run into this every single day. When a problem comes up, there are those who want to use their minds and they want to think logically. They want to think about what we need to do, just thinking about what needs to happen next. And then there are those who think with their heart. They began to experience all these things and their emotions get involved. They're not thinking logically, but rather they are thinking with their heart. And then there are others who simply think, about how can they use their hands to solve this problem. There are those who don't care about the thoughts or the hearts. They just want to know how to get involved in the work. And then the last thing is that you think about the good news. And this is simply the message of salvation and how you can be reminded to share with others this wonderful good news that God has blessed all of us with. Let's start this morning by thinking about the testimony. Some of you may remember a few years ago, we did a little thing called Every Believer a Witness. And out of that little thing that we did, there were, uh, we were taught how to share our testimonies, how to simply share with others what God has done with you. Now, the first thing on that list is what my life was like before I met Christ. Now, for some of you, there are, it is not hard for you to think about what your life was before you met Christ. You met him older. You may be in late teenage years or something. And so you very much remember your life before you met Christ. Now, some of you, you were saved as a child. You grew up in church. There was never a day that Jesus was not a part of your home. And so you have no clue what your life would be like before you met Christ because it really didn't change. You just opened your heart and received what God gave to you, but your life didn't change that much because you had always been a part of church. You'd always been a part of Christianity. And for you, I would simply say, just imagine. Imagine what your life would have been. It's not hard to think about those things. If you value yourself as a human, then look at other humans. See what other humans' life is like without Christ. And think about what roads would you have gone down if you had not trusted Christ when you did. The second part of your testimony needs to be how I realized I needed Christ. Was it in a church service? Was it in a Sunday school class? 
Was it in vacation Bible school? Or did somebody come by and talk with you about Jesus? And suddenly as they were talking, you began to realize, I need someone greater than myself. You need to come to grips with how you realize that you needed Jesus. Thirdly, how did you actually come about committing your life to Jesus? Now, this is a very important <laughs> because there are going to be people who will ask you, how did I do that? How do I do that? And you need to be able to just tell them how you yourself came to commit your life to Christ. And then the last part of your testimony needs to be the difference that Jesus has made in my life. And I told the early service, and I just well tell you, if Jesus is not making a difference in your life, if the only part of your testimony you know is that I got saved back in 1963 and my life's been perfect ever since, well, I would encourage you to do like they say in computers. It's time for an upgrade. Time for an update on your testimony. You need to look around. You need to be aware of what God is doing in your life today. What are some things that God has done recently in your life? You need to be thinking about God and what he is doing in your heart and life. Now, the second part of your what we do as a witness is we think about the, uh, the God, the life lessons that he has given to us. In Proverbs chapter 25, verse number 12, the Bible says, a warning given by an experienced person. Now everybody look right here for one second. An experienced person. It's why you need to upgrade your testimony. You need to be aware of what you are experiencing of God right now. A lot of times we think, well, my life doesn't have any drama in it. Nothing very exciting about what God's doing in my life. Nobody's going to want to hear what I have to say. And so we start borrowing our little bit from this person, borrowing a little bit from that person, just to beef up our personal experience with God. Heard about a fellow one time, stood up in church, and he said, I want to tell you my life before I met Christ was horrible. I did drugs. I was mixed up with alcohol. I was mean to people. I was corrupt. Spent some time in jail. But when I turned seven years old, all of that changed. <laughs> Folks, it's real easy to borrow experiences from someone else. And it's real easy to let the devil downplay what you have experienced in your own personal life. But trust God. Put your confidence in God. Because what God has done in your life, he really wants to use that as you become a witness to other people, you'll be surprised at how much healing and how much life God can bring into the life of other people as you share what you have experienced from him. Proverbs 25 verse 12 continues. A warning given by an experienced person to someone willing to listen is more valuable than gold rings or jewelry made of the finest gold. I told you just a moment ago about our experience on Wednesday night where Philip had been told to go talk to an Ethiopian eunuch. And as he walked up to that eunuch, that eunuch was reading the very story of Jesus from the Old Testament. And all Philip had to ask him is, do you understand what this is about? And he said, no, tell me about this story. And it was there ready for him. Don't you wish every experience of sharing your faith with others could be just like that faith? Well, this is where your confidence in God comes in. Not only do you have confidence that God's going to be working in your heart, you have confidence that God is working in the lives of those that you have an opportunity to share with. They may not look like they're willing to listen, but you share what God is doing in your life, and you'll be amazed at how God can use that to be something of far greater value than gold rings or jewelry made of the finest gold. 
life lessons. We all have them. So what have you experienced? What have you experienced from failure? Now, I know you know people who have never failed, but I'm sure each and every one of us have those little moments where we have failed. And boy, did we learn a lot from that time that I failed. I wish I could remember exactly what a guy said in our Sunday school this morning. He, I think he said, when my feet are in the sand and water's rushing around them, it's one of the most pleasant feelings of life. But when my feet are in the fire, that's when I've really learned a lot about life. So what has God, what have you experienced from God as you walk through failure? Those times in your life when money wasn't as plentiful as you would really have liked it to be. What have you experienced during those times of a lack of money? What about those times of pain and suffering? What did you experience from God during those times? Or that time when you were waiting, waiting and wondering, would I get that job? Waiting on that report from a doctor, waiting on news about this or waiting on news about that. Will I get into school? Will I do okay on this test I just took? In those times of waiting, what have you experienced about life? Those times of illness. All of us have gone through illness, either our own personal illness or the illness of someone that we loved deeply. What about times of disappointment? Surely, all of us know what it means to be disappointed. What about those times in your family? What have you learned from the experience with family? And what have you learned about your experience in church? Or what did you learn when you experienced that criticism? When you had critics in your life? What has your life taught you? What kind of lessons have you learned from God through the experiences of your life? Thirdly, I want to talk with you about godly passions. God wants you to be about a ministry in the body of Christ, but he also wants you to be about a mission out in the world. Wouldn't it be nice if all we had to deal with was nice Christian people? Notice I qualified all of that. Nice Christian people, not necessarily just church folks. Sometimes you, all you deal with is church folks. You can get a little disappointed, can't you? What about nice Christian people? Don't you really wish all you had to do was be around nice Christian people? Well, God not only wants you to use your life, but he wants you to use your life in here, but he wants to use your life out beyond the doors of this church as well. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse number 5, so it is with the body of Christ. We are all parts of his one body, And each of us has different work to do. And every single one of us go about doing that work in different ways. As I told you, some of us use our heads. We've just got a mind for how things ought to work. Some of us use our hearts, and that's how we approach life. Some of us just use our elbows and our hands, and we love to get our hands dirty and get involved in whatever work needs to be done. But notice what Paul says. Since we all belong to Christ, we belong to each other, and each one of us needs all the others. You ever seen somebody that had a stroke? A part of their body just doesn't work anymore? Well, folks, if you could see the body of Christ sometime from that perspective, you might see that it looks like the church has actually had a stroke. And sometimes we just need to be involved, whether we use our heads, our heart, our hands, ever how you get involved, every single one of us needs every single one of us. Look, if you would, at this Danish proverb. Danish proverb says, what you are is God's gift to you. What you do with yourself is your gift back to God. So what are you giving God? Maybe you'll understand it better from this passage. In Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart 
may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. And then he says, and the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Ever notice when the game is over, when the final whistle blows, all the seconds have ticked off of the clock, what does God get? Well, truth of the matter is, <laughs> he gets you. But what will you be giving God? Just like that Danish proverb said, what you are, that's what God has given you. Now, what you do with that, that's what you are giving back to God. Well, the last part of your witness, the last part of your testimony is simply about the good news. Paul says in Romans 1 that the good news show how God makes people right with himself. That's what really being a witness is all about. How people can invite God into their life through the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice that Paul says that begins and it ends with faith. But then he says, Scripture tells us those who are right with God will live by trusting him. As you go out into the world this afternoon, as you go out into the world tomorrow, I encourage you to open your eyes and just be aware of the opportunities that God is given to you. Whether God is giving you an opportunity to share your testimony, whether God is calling on you just to share a lesson that you have learned from life, whether God is giving you just an opportunity to be passionate in some way about something he is stirring your heart to do. Maybe somebody will sort of flip that switch or open that door in your life and give you an opportunity just to share with them the good news. But remember, what God is calling us to do is to be a witness unto him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the very ends of the world. Folks, God wants to use you every single day of your life just to scatter seeds everywhere that you go about his love, how he cares for people, how he has cared for you, how he has walked with you through some of the difficulties of your life. God wants you to be a witness on behalf of him. Not only that, he wants you to be a witness everywhere that you go. There are opportunities out there everywhere. And if you'll just be sensitive, God will open those opportunities for you. Folks, you were made for more. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time together today. We thank you for each and every person that is here. And Lord, I just pray you'll bless this time and honor this time of invitation and decision. And Father, if there are those here today that have never opened their heart and received you as their Savior and Lord, I pray that today will be the day they'll, they'll do that. They'll simply trust in Jesus to forgive them of their sin, trust in him to bring them into the family of God. Father, I pray for Christians here this morning that you'll stir their hearts to take advantage of the opportunities that you give to them to be a witness for you everywhere that they go. Bless this time of invitation now we pray and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're gonna stand together and we're gonna sing. This is an opportunity that God is giving to you to trust him as your Savior and Lord. If you've never done that, I pray that today will be your day that you'll come this morning if I can help you. I'd love to share with you how you personally can know Jesus as your Savior and Lord. We're going to stand together as we sing. If there's decisions on your heart, whatever God would have you to do, you come. I'll meet you right here at the front. You give life, you are love.
Church, you can be seated for just a moment. Hey, don't forget about all of our announcements we had at the beginning of service. Um, we're going to put that on Facebook as well. So if you see that, go ahead and share that for us, just in case somebody is not here on vacation. Um, uh, or just wants to see us, as Taylor said. Um, so we can make sure that we're getting those announcements out. Now, we have one other announcement we have to make. Um, Ms. Crystal wanted me to make the announcement today of any lady um, that wants to help on the Ladies of Grace event on August the 6th. If you want to help decorate a table or even provide gifts for the table, um, she will be, will you be back here? She's going to be back there at that table. Please go back there and see her so she can kind of get a head count of what all she needs and if she needs any more. Um, also, if you want to sing, ladies, if you want to sing in the choir on August the 6th for the Ladies of Grace Conference, just come to worship practice on the Wednesday night before that. I think that's August the 3rd, maybe. Check your calendars. It's the Wednesday night before the 6th. It'd be the 3rd. Yes, and Taylor's going to teach you how to, Six how minus to do three that. Is three. There we go. Anyway. Bless his heart. Anyway, let me pray for us and you guys will be dismissed. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for the gospel and the cross. Thank you so much for the ability to share about how Christ so incredibly saved us and has transformed us. And Father, I pray that we would continue to have uh, that transformation power in our lives that would continue to make us better disciples of you. And so, Father, I pray that we would uphold this challenge and take this challenge to share the gospel through our testimony and that, God, we would pin our testimony down. We would be always available to share that and always um, part to share that. So, Father, I pray that you would be magnified and glorified in our lives and today as we go that you would allow this word to sit with us and to resonate in our hearts um, so we can be better disciples and we can give you better glory. We can be people who would share the gospel. God, we love you so much. Thank you for the cross and the empty tomb. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey, one more thing. One more thing, guys. I've been asked to recruit some muscle. Apparently, I'm not enough. Um, Y'all can laugh at that. It's okay. Uh, Paige needs four guys, willing guys to, well, she needs four tables. Guys, can y'all help bring four rectangle tables, put them in the back. They're downstairs. Four, right? Four. Great. That would be a lot of help, and do that immediately after I stop talking. Thank y'all. Have a great afternoon.